tonight's symposium on uh, Bountiful Yards. I'm Peter Marcatulio. I'm Deputy Director of the CUNY Institute for Sustainable Cities, which is the sponsor and host of this event. Um, as you probably already know, CISC uh, was originally envisioned and financially supported by Ted Keel, which, who was a prominent labor negotiator, lawyer, and environmentalist. CISC is now a prominent CUNY Institute located here at Hunter College in the 12th floor of the Hunter East Building. So if you have time and energy, why don't you stop on by during working hours? Um, the Institute is composed of CUNY faculty and students and staff. And we're all dedicated to realizing the potential of cities as the global sustainability solutions. Um, among the myriad of issues that CISC concentrates on, uh, we look at uh, three crucial environmental challenges. They include consumption, and consumption issues such as food consumption in the city, we uh, examine the vulnerability and resilience challenges, how to make the city more resilient to things like climate change. And we also examine ecosystem services, looking at where they are in the city and how, they, how much they provide for human well-being to, uh, to New York's uh, residents. Tonight, the theme of this symposium cuts across all three of these areas. Namely, the panelists will examine how yards and other small plots of land in low density urban and suburban areas can be used to facilitate food production. Now, as I'm sure this audience knows, the recent literature and policy debates, there's a lot of emphasis on our agricultural system, the industrial system, the organic system, the traditional system, etc. Recent findings have advanced the urban agriculture as a supplement to, if not a cure, for some of the ills of, industrial, of our industrial system. All too little attention, however, has been given to the suburbs. And this is surprising. Approximately 41% of the total urban area in the United States is given over to residential use. And if you calculate, this comes out to something like 165 square kilometers of lawn space in suburban areas. 165 square kilometers is about 74,000 square miles, which is potential area for agricultural production. Now, 64,000 square miles is, a, is actually larger than the state of New York. So besides this potential, tonight's speakers will be examining um, using plots for social, economic, and institutional change within the food system. They will tackle questions from a variety of angles, such as using small plot production as a vehicle for community-centered economic development and food justice, integrating urban agriculture into education for future food service professionals, developing an operating system that places small plots and suburban farms at the center of a strategy to build a more resilient and non-hierarchical food system, and ways in which to use small plots, and ways in which small plots has been used over time. So uh, with that introduction, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Mike Menser. Um, Professor Menser is at Brooklyn College. He's in the philosophy department. Um, he's been teaching there since about 1995. He's very involved with food policy and the sustainability debate, and particularly with a focus on justice issues. At BC, he is on the Sustainability Council and the Provost Task Force for City-Based Sustainability Education. He advises the BC Coffee Collective, which is a student-run cafe in the Student Center, and the Students for Global Justice Club. He is the president of the Participatory Budgeting Project, which has seen some interesting advances over the last few weeks. Uh, Michael is also a member of the doctoral faculty, of course, at the GC in the Earth and Environmental Sciences uh, uh, area. 
So uh, let me turn the floor over to Michael. He'll be your moderator tonight. So let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Alexander wants to say one thing. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Hansen. I just want to thank you guys all for coming out tonight. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Institute. Um, I just wanted to say I apologize for the noise. Uh, some of you are aware this event was actually originally supposed to take place in the uh, eighth floor faculty dining hall. Um, however, because of a mistake with booking, they actually ended up double booking the room. So we were moved down here. Um, so we're going to try to do our best. Again, we apologize for the noise, but if any of you are having trouble um, in the back hearing because of the noise, feel free to come up. There's some seats um, towards the front. And thank you so much for understanding. And again, thank you so much for coming out tonight. And again, here's Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. So we have four great panelists, four great presentations. I'm going to turn it over in just two minutes. And uh, I just want to give a, a little one kind of context for thinking about urban agriculture. You know, uh, the Mississippi River, sometimes it's called the Mississippi River, sometimes it's called the Mississippi River Valley, sometimes it's called the R Mississippi River System, is, as you probably know, uh, in a calamitous situation. And there's floods up and down. Uh, this major, you know, marker of the United States, which divides it in half in certain ways and also links the two halves in certain ways. And I had the good fortune of growing up uh, in many of the states that are flooding right now, uh, including Louisiana, Kentucky, and Ohio, uh, Indiana, um, and a couple, uh, Texas. Um, and it's, you know, when the kind of damage that's being done to farmlands and urban areas, which are in many ways being pitted against right, uh, one another right now, we're flooding this part to save this part, and we're opening this channel to save this other part. And I was trying to think, you know, when I think about urban agriculture, a lot of times I think it's revolutionary, and then other times I think it's, it's quaint. And, and I think, in you know, reading Laura's book, in City Bountiful, I kind of, you know, there's this one, on the one level, it's this very intimate kind of small scale thing, but then if it, it kind of fits into this other context, which seems revolutionary, and I think that when we think, of, look at what's happening in this river system, which is a, a, you know, is it a thousand year flood, or it's at least a hundred year flood, basically you have to go back to the 30s to see this kind of damage. Um, and what growing food in cities should do is change the way we farm and where we farm and how we farm. And also it should change the way that cities relate to their own watersheds. So I kind of just want to give that as a context. So we, we think we have this series of environmental catastrophes that are occurring. And I think that urban agriculture is part of a way of thinking about alternatives to this spatial configuration um, that is so uh, ill-equipped to deal with the realities of the 21st century in regard to not only the ecology, but the economy. So I kind of just, and I'm sure we'll hear more specifics about that as we proceed. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with Laura Lawson uh, from Rutgers, and then we'll go to Ari Feinstein from uh, Murdoch University in Australia, uh, Deborah Gregg from East New York Farms, and Babette Audant from Kingsborough. So I'll begin uh, by introducing uh, Laura. Laura uh, Lawson is professor and chair in the Department of Landscape Architecture at Rutgers. Uh, her research includes historical and contemporary community open space with particular focus on community gardens and the changing roles of parks and low-income communities. She is author of City Bountiful that I highly recommend for the historical context of thinking about the waves in which these movements rise and crash. Um, and most recently, greeting with um, Jeff Hu and Julie Johnson, Greening Cities, Growing Communities, Urban Community Gardens in Seattle. So, Laura. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, primarily about uh, community gardens. I tend to kind of flip-flop in my terminology between urban gardening, community gardening, urban agriculture, because I see them all kind of related to each other, although there's specifics in each one together. What they represent to me is an ongoing um, effort to bring places for people to garden and grow food in cities. So I'm going to start with just a couple definitions of community gardening to give a sense of what we're talking about. The most simple definition is um, a piece of land gardened by people. Um, that's by the American Community Gardening Association and includes not just growing food but also greening efforts to um, reclaim vacant land and to bring in habitat and other factors. Mark Francis has defined it as a neighborhood space designed, developed, or managed by local residents. And that really gets at some of the grassroots qualities of a lot of these efforts. 
And I tend to focus on the organizations and the programs that coordinate the gardens, the, manage the land, and provide a lot of the programming. Because um, in my research, I've seen that these gardens are um, amazingly um, resilient to, to a point, um, yet they need the network of support from organizations and programs um, to sustain themselves. So why do we community garden? Um, when I first started doing this research, I did a national survey. And I sent out a survey, a mailed questionnaire to every community garden group I could find. And one of my questions was, you know, what benefits do you get from community gardening? Check all that apply. And I had a list of about 20 things. And can anyone guess what the answers were? All of them. Everyone checked everything. And that really gets at what people think community gardening does. They, it, it's a link to all sorts of benefits with gardening. Um, everything from connecting to nature, to growing food, to exercise, to community revitalization. But the real question is how do we garden? And more particularly, how do we sustain these gardens? Um, this is a, some images of a garden I used to run in Berkeley, California. And it was a garden for at-risk teenagers, um, a job training program. And in 1992, it was a vacant site. It was an old railroad right-of-way um, with negligible amounts of DDT and compacted soil. And after five years, we could dig in the earth. Um, and we had built a lot of raised beds. And a lot of things had happened. But we were still working on a year-to-year -year lease. And we were not allowed to put any kind of shed or structure on the site. And there was all sorts of other limitations on what we were able to do. And that really led me back into research about why, do, why is this so difficult to do when everyone likes it? When it's linked to all sorts of benefits, why is it so hard? And I started talking to a lot of gardeners, and that's where this research really started. And this is what I found out. I looked historically, and I found out we've been doing this for a really long time. Basically, since we've been an industrialized nation, we have been trying to garden in cities. Um, and what my research showed was that there's various eras of, um, there's movements in community gardening, and they're often linked to a crisis at hand. An economic crisis, war, social unrest. There's a peak in interest in gardening, and then it drops after that crisis is done. That doesn't mean that people stop gardening. It just means that the momentum has dropped. So let me run you through a few of these to give a sense of it. From the 1890s to the 1920s, there were three kind of campaigns underway that were linked closely. One was the Vacant Lot Cultivation Associations, um, which was basically a program providing land to unemployed workers during the Depression of 1893. It started in Detroit with Hazen Pingree's um, Pingree Potato Patches, um, where people got quartered a half acre lots, which is, you know, to die for now, um, seeds and instructions in three languages. They grew produce. Um, at first, the program was ridiculed, and they found, though, that the um, results were amazing. And very soon, it became a mandatory program for anyone seeking um, relief, and it was replicated in many other communities. The program um, was really about, if you give a man a fish kind of attitude, or um, that the, separating the deserving poor from the undeserving poor. This is the beginning of some new ideas about charity. And the idea is that there's a lot of urban laborers, and if we could attach them to land, maybe they would go into agriculture, which was, at that point, struggling in the Northeast. At the same time, there was the school garden movement. And the first school garden um, in the United States was in Boston in 1891. And um, very quickly, the effort grew into, until 1914, the um, Bureau of Education, the federal precursor to the Department of Education, um, set up an office of home and school gardening to promote gardening across the nation through children. And so schools um, created gardens on their properties in vacant lots and in community gardens, also promoting children to take it home um, with the idea that if children take it home, they might have an influence on their parents. And at the same time, oh, so this is the DeWitt Clinton Farm School at the site that's now the DeWitt Clinton Park. Um, it had 270 kids gardening on plots of four, by, four foot by eight foot, um, very um, organized, very you know, rigid kind of ideas about what the gardening was. At the same time, there was the civic gardening campaign. Um, during this era, the backyard is rediscovered. Um, this is uh, when sewage systems go in place and your yard is no longer kind of an ash pit 
and suddenly you can start kind of saying, oh, this could be pretty. Um, also, a lot of the suburbs, which we, you know, we complain today about suburbs being ugly, but back then they complained about suburbs being ugly too. And so it was this idea to get people gardening for food and flowers, often through children, um, often spearheaded by women's clubs and women's organizations, as well as gardening clubs and civic um, organizations. Those efforts continued until World War I. In World War I, um, when the United States entered the war, there was a severe food crisis in Europe. And the best way that um, the US could send food overseas was to increase domestic production here. And the War Garden campaign started. And it basically took all of the school gardens, and they became the US School Garden Army, and a lot of um, civic activism to create gardens so that people could grow food um, so that more could be sent overseas. These images kind of give you the flavor of the era. It was very urgent. Um, if you, you, you needed to garden as part of this war effort, if you didn't garden, people were starving. Um, there was language about um, weeds being the enemies of the state and um, a hoe being mightier, mightier than the gun. Um, there was a lot of imagery about this being really part of a war effort. Any land that could be gardened was considered um, available, and if you didn't garden it, it was slacker land. Um, if you didn't garden, you were kind of equated with being lazy in some way. So it was a huge effort, and it was very successful. Um, but really what happened after that is I think people were really tired. And so after World War I, it kind of interest in gardening um, slumps a bit. It's rediscovered in the 1930s with the, um, the Great Depression. Some of the first efforts to address um, unemployment and underemployment were, were by local charities and municipalities starting garden programs so that they could grow food for the unemployed. Those programs developed into state programs and for a brief bit there was a federally funded gardening program um, in two, two types. One was a um, subsistence garden programs so that people could um, get food or get seed and, and instruction and grow either at their home or in a community garden or work relief programs where you would grow food and it would be used in schools and hospitals. But the big difference that happens at this era is um, whereas before there was a lot of information about um, selling and how the, the food grown in cities was fresher and better than the stuff that you were getting from the truck farms and from far away. In this era, um, they did not allow sales um, because farmers were also struggling. And so this is a real shift into this being about consumption, not production. When um, World War II hit, a big changes that happened in agriculture between World War I and World War II, so that when the United States um, entered into this war, initially the experts did not want war gardening. Um, they thought it would be a waste of of resources um, that people had done it inefficiently in the past. However, 11 days after Pearl Harbor, um, there was such a groundswell of interest for people to do something that the Victory Garden campaign came into play. The, and it was incredibly successful. The big difference to me in my research was in World War I, a lot of the, um, the, the literature was about urgency about doing this. In World War II, it was about um, doing something, being patriotic, but also this was good for you. Um, we were finding that um, a lot of the soldiers going in were malnourished. This is an era when um, nutrition is, you know, ideas of, of health and nutrition were coming into play. And so getting more fresh vegetables, um, gardening as recreation, gardening as restoration. Um, a lot of information about if you garden, um, it was an emotional release. So for people that were working more than one job in the, in the war industries, or when you have a loved one overseas, you could garden as a way of contributing, but also healing yourself through that process. It was also meant to be recreation in that with rationing, you couldn't go on vacations anymore. And so gardening became a hobby that you could do. And you never got dirty if you were a woman, yes. These are, this is Marion Talley, a famous opera singer in her Victory Garden in Beverly Hills. Um, and these are two women in San Francisco who came up with a creative childcare plan for their garden. And most of the literature from that era has these kind of absolutely wonderful, enjoyable women in white socks gardening kind of stuff. So Victory Gardens, um, it was a national effort um, that had a lot of support from the USDA, from um, the Board of Education, from all sorts of realms. 
And when the war ended, most of the land that was garden reverted to other uses. Um, and most people's backyards kind of changed ideas about growing food into outdoor living kind of ideas. That doesn't mean that some victory gardens didn't remain. And there's some community gardens today that were victory gardens in World War II. And there's some that are even older than that. But for the most part, there's a big lull in the 50s kind of with gardening until um, the late seven, mid, mid 70s when community gardening comes up again. And this time it's largely coming out of urban um, unrest, inflation, new ideas about the environment. Um, the urban version of back to the land was coming into play. Um, this is Liz Christie's garden um, before it was built. And this is Liz Christie's garden last year. Um, and so groups like Green Gorillas came into, um, came into being, Boston Urban Gardeners, San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners. Um, they usually have names like Big Bug, Doug, Slug. Um, organizations that were promoting and supporting these efforts to take vacant land and make it into gardens. And um, in 1978, 1976, it was supported by the USDA creating the Urban Gardening Program, which brought extension agents into cities. That was a huge benefit for the movement. Um, it was killed in 1992, I think. Um, and, uh, and then the American Community Gardening Association formed in 1978 so that we had a national organization kind of um, lobbying and providing education and information about it. Um, in the 80s, as um, economies improved, however, there started to be stories of gardens being lost, particularly from New York, um, where gardens on vacant lands were considered now to be vacant and that those, that land was more valuable for housing. And so many of the um, efforts in community gardening came to be about lobbying, came to be about um, protecting land and no longer being satisfied with a temporary opportunistic approach to gardening, but really looking at longer land tenure and ownership issues. And these are some examples. This is a garden um, that was destroyed. Um, the Clinton Community Garden here um, was up, the site was up for auction. Oh, yeah, well, yeah sorry. I'm talking fast because I only have 10 minutes, and I talk fast anyway, but. Um, the Clinton Community Garden here was going to be destroyed and the group got together and did a very creative, community gardeners are always creative, um, of selling square inches to um, purchase the property. It's a gated garden and ha have you guys been there? It's, I think so. It's been a long time since I've been there too. It's only two or three blocks from the DeWitt Clinton Farm School site. Um, what is it? West 48th Street. West 48th Street, okay. Thank you. Um, and it's fenced, but if you see, if you look at it, um, there's garden plots on the outside and then there's open space in the middle. And during this era, a lot of what community gardens, um, the argument was that it was community open space, particularly in communities that didn't have a lot of open space. And so lawns and um, areas of, of trees and flowers and habitat became part of kind of what these gardens could be, particularly in very urbanized communities. And here's the West Side Community Garden, which um, was destroyed to build housing, um, but the housing developer worked with the gardeners to rebuild a smaller garden at the site um, that again has a very kind of community open space feel to it. Today, um, there is a huge range of community gardens, everything from neighborhood gardens to job training programs, children's gardens, for-profit, um, urban ag, and there's kind of an uneasy situation right now between the um, the nonprofit and the for-profit kind of urban ag scene. Um, um, but there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on. And the big question that I keep raising is, based on my historical research, we've had these waves of interest. And then they don't last. And then we reinvent gardening. And then, you know, it fits into a new era, a new, new need. However, I would argue that it's, if you looked at it across the board, it's a trend, not a fad, and we really need to be careful right now not to just be opportunistic with it, but to look at issues um, that will sustain these gardens. You know, we have Michelle Obama right now as a big advocate for school gardening and for this kind of gardening. I think we have to work that to make some of these gardens um, sustain longer. And while the idea of gardening and greening is very seductive, particularly in my field, People really love the idea of gardening and greening. We need to do it smartly. 
um, we can't do it based on, um, these are for what um, people in my field in planning and design tend to do. We tend to like the pretty pictures of happy people. We put in a green square and we think that that's a garden. And uh, we know that a garden takes people. And those people make a choice when they're gardening. And, and it's a hard work and we better make it a useful choice. Um, and it's not just a, a pretty design, but it's a, it's a activity that you have to sustain. And so really what it comes down to is to sustain these gardens, you have to attend to the participants of that garden, the land, and then the supporting structures and resources that enable um, the activity to continue. If you just deal with one part of it, it's going to be a weak program. You know, you might have the most active participants in the world, but if you don't attend to land tenure, um, that garden is susceptible to being lost. If you have a site, but you have not been doing community outreach um, and constant engagement to keep people involved, then you're going to lose your gardeners, and the garden has trouble there. And support structures and resources, because anyone who gardens knows it is hard work. It's wonderful work. Those of you who garden know that you love it, but you also have to acknowledge that it's, it's exhausting and you often need resources to um, sustain your interest. So that's kind of my spiel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. And we'll, we'll have time for follow-up. Uh, so we're going to go from the historical to the theoretical in terms of how we conceive of, of urban agriculture and gardening as a system. And that brings us to Ari Feinstein, who is an invited researcher to promote CUNY Institute, uh, Initiative for Institute for Computer Simulation, Stochastic Modeling, and Optimization. He was born and raised in Mexico City, graduated with a degree in electrical engineering from McGill University, and has close to 20 years of experience as a system architect. When he's not picking up horse, cow, and sheep manure, Ari is CTO of Stakeware, a leading provider of software for stakeholder relationship management. He's also a PhD candidate at the Institute for Sustainable, Sustainability and Technology Policy at Murdoch University in Perth, Australia. So, Ari. How do you start this? Oh. Go to slideshow. Um, the last time uh, anybody in my family touched soil, probably Moses was around. So I don't really come from, from a background of farming. I was one of those guys that was doing really well until the dot-com boom went bust. And it was one of those times in your life where you know you didn't lose a job, the job sort of disappeared. And I started looking for something to do when I grew up, and I didn't want to go too far apart from where I was, because it's too hard to start when, you know, from scratch. So I wanted to leverage some of my expertise in system architecture, which basically means you go to somebody, some company, they tell you their problems, and you give them a software solution, and you get paid. And, and I started, at that time, I had come back from Europe, and I put on a bunch of weight, and then I got posted to Nike, which it was kind of like destiny telling me go lose the weight. And at the same time, the farmer's market in San Francisco, I used to live in San Francisco, started to pick up. And it's one of those things that I started realizing that every calorie counted, so I had to make the best of it, of, you know, of each one of them. And so I started getting into the whole food thing. And again, because I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, I, I came about it from a system architecture perspective. Now, this is where I live now. And uh, so this is Melbourne here. And uh, I live here. And we also have a little store in here. Oh, sorry. So um, I live in a farm, which is uh, here. This, is, this place is called Kyneton, or the, the, the farming district is called Kyneton. And we have a little place here in, this, in the city of Melbourne. There's about 60 miles dif uh, distance between the two of them. Um, this, is, this is what my farm looks like. It's in Australia, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Melbourne, Australia, not Melbourne, Florida. So um, this is what my farm looked like from Google Earth when I first moved in there. And this little building is where I sleep. This little building is my, my office. And this black spot here is a dam. My property goes like that, and so all this area. It's about 34 acres. Half of it is forest, as you can see here, mostly regrowth eucalyptus, and the other half of it um, is clear. Now, how I got to this is because in 2001 I read that book, and then later on I read that book. 
And the one thing that sort of became obvious is, and, and what got me interested as sort of a generalized form of the problem, was that it was very clear that, as Michael Pollan said, it would be easier if we drank oil directly, as opposed to have to put it through a bunch of animals that we end up eating. And so it was essential that, to me, the, 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 the key problem that I had to solve for my client was how to get rid of oil from the food supply. And so, essentially, that's what I've been doing for the past few years. I still can't get cabbages to grow, but I got a great theory on how to you know, solve the problem. And so, the one, thing that, um, the one thing that got me thinking about this is when I read the, the Poland book, it's everything starts with the oil companies. And the oil companies get oil and natural gas, and they give it to the chemical companies who make fertilizers and pesticides. And then those people give it to industrial agriculture that together make soybeans and corn and, and together with GMO seeds, they produce all these things. Now, what's interesting is that they, so then they give the corn and the soy to these things called CAFOs, confined animal feeding operation, which is kind of like a concentration camp for cows, actually specifically for dairy cows which no longer produce milk efficiently. And then they turn that into meat and then the meat with the bread and the potatoes, you get your McDonald's hamburger. Now, again, um, the one thing, there's two, the more I looked at it, the more I realized that essentially oil has two fundamental um, roles in the food supply today. Number one is transportation. Um, but I like to think of it as movement because transportation is not complete enough. And the other one is fertility. Now, I didn't know what fertility was some time ago recently. And so I figure, just to make sure we're on the same ballpark, I'll tell you what I understand by fertility. So if you want to grow plants, you need a piece of soil. And usually the soil has minerals in them. So when you put some seeds, some water, and some sun, what ends up happening is that you end up getting plants. Now there's no magic. The plants grow because they have sun and seeds and water, but also because they have minerals and stuff that the soil needs and then they take up, you know, they pick them up. So what happens is when, when you uh, take the plants out because you're going to eat them or do whatever you want with them, you end up with soil that has less of what you started with. And this is where the chemical companies come in. Because what they do is they produce fertil fertilizer that replenish that so you can start the process again. Now, now that you understand what I mean by fertility, um, I put a little frame around it. And again, to me, as a computer guy, when you start reading and you look at this diagram, I want you to imagine you go to your computer, you type a Microsoft Word document, and you print it onto a piece of paper. Now you got a physical representation of your interaction with the computer, more specifically with the operating system of the computer. OK, so now take, take a leap of faith and imagine that a hamburger is an output of a different operating system, an operating system that relates to food. Now, I don't like, so you could, also, you could say that um, a hamburger is the, an output of the operating system of food. I don't particularly like that concept because one can live without iPhones or, or toilets. Those are things that you could say uh, objects, you know, the operating system of telephones. Food is something we can't live without. You know, no food, we all die. And so personally, I like to think of, I, I like to call it the operating system of sustenance. Somehow the word sustenance represents more of the, what food means to us. And so because, um, because this operating system is all based industrial, in industrial principles, I, I call it the industrial operating system of sustenance. So you could say that a hamburger, from McDonald's hamburger or Domino's pizza is an output of the IOSS. So now, there, now, that, now that we can conceptualize the supply chain of a, of a fast food nation, of a fast food company, um, we can start thinking, we can start describing this from a certain operational perspectives. The first one is the fact that the IOSS communicates with its customers, which was us, using a language. That language is this one. 
It is a language because it has words, it has a grammar. You can read, you can look at any box in the supermarket and it'll probably have the same sort of structure. Um, and all the characteristics of the operating system of uh, industrial or the IOSS is that it, it functions on the idea that intellectual property is used as a competitive advantage. So, you know, you have an idea and you patent it so that nobody else can use it so that you can actually benefit from it by either controlling the market or selling licensing agreements. Now, the, um, usually IOSS, uh, companies that participate in the IOSS, the way they get funding for their operations is usually um, through either stock or debt, equity or debt. And usually they try to do equity better than debt because they don't have to pay interest. And so they have, let's call it a legal or a social contract, which is you give me your money and in exchange I solemnly swear I will maximize the return on your investment. And so we think of, of maximizing return to shareholders as a source of funding for operations. And finally, um, the IOSS is it's what, it's what I call the capacity-dependent energy system. Now, the best way to understand this is, is using an example. Um, imagine you got two electrical generating units. One of them runs on coal, and the other one runs on hydro, on water. Now, the coal plant is thought of as a capacity-dependent system because if you could have, you assume that you have unlimited amounts of coal, or it doesn't matter what the fuel is, but there's no limitation on the fuel. So if you build a plant twice as big, you end up with twice as much fuel, which you know you can get. And so the output is really limited by the capacity of that system. In this particular case, if, if McDonald's could convince us to eat twice as much hamburgers, that we will just eat more and then they will just order more meat and then magically the meat would appear. So those are three important things that describe the operation of the IOSS. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll introduce you to Ginger. Ginger is a different operating system uh, of sustenance, I guess, and Ginger has the following, this is the business, this is the business model of Ginger. Harvesting energy for growing soil and selling time. And, um, and so, some of the characteristics of Ginger is it's open source. And it's actually a bit misleading because it's beyond open source. Open source started in the software world. And the idea of open source is, is, is when, you have in the piece, when you have a software that is free, but not free as in free beer, free as in free speech. So you, it's not that you don't have to pay to use it, it's that you have the right to use it. Now I say that open source short changes uh, what Ginger is trying to do, because in reality, Ginger is more like open data source. Because part of the idea of Ginger is the fact that we need to create a new way to structure data so that it's easily transferable across um, the world. And it has to do with the way agriculture is different than other data systems because in, in, other, in other data related systems, when you have machines, as long as you provide the right environment, let's say you put them in a warehouse with the right temperature, a machine will behave the same way in Florida as they will behave in, let's say, Connecticut. Food is not like that. Food is completely dependent on where you grow it. So while tomatoes might be perennial in Florida, they're not going to be perennial in, let's say, Maya, in uh, Maine. And so when I want information about tomatoes, I want it to be, give me the information about tomatoes for 37 degrees south of the equator, which is where I live. And so, um, so open source, open data source is a very big component of this. Now, as far as uh, finding sources for, for operations, Ginger takes the opposite approach of um, the IOSS in that Ginger is designed to maximize community resilience as a way to, so to fund operations. So everything in Ginger revolves around that principle. Now Ginger is also an energy constraint system. So this is more like the hydro plant. Now why do I say that? Because in Ginger, from the bottom up, we assume that we don't have enough energy. We'll never have enough energy. 
And I mean, and this is, this is at, at heart is the fundamental uh, part of the operation. Um, not, only, not only we can't assume that we have infinite amount of energy, we, we, on, we also assume that the, the quality of the energy that we have is never going to be as good. And I'm using the word quality very loosely. What I'm saying is this, it's a lot easier to build a system around something like gasoline that once you get it out of the earth and refine it, you can store it, it has incredibly energy density. I mean, it's just, and we have a hundred years worth of experience using machines that can transform that energy store in, let's say, gasoline into useful work. Ginger assumes that our energy quality is going to be not as good as in the other cases, and not only as, re and not only as reliable as in the other cases. Um, and finally, Ginger is designed to minimize the cost of distribution. Now, this is a little bit tricky. I, I use these words, Ginger, to begin with. Cost of distribution is probably not what you're thinking. What probably you're thinking is what I would call distribution cost. Now, a distribution cost is what Walmart pays to move a roll of toilet paper from Chengdu to Wichita Falls, which is somebody going to use it. But I, what I mean by minimize the cost of distribution is it can be explained as if I grow a key, uh, one pound of tomatoes and I sell it for a dollar, and then you buy that two pound of tomato, but you paid four dollars, the cost of distributing those tomatoes to me was three bucks. Ginger is designed to minimize the cost of distribution. And in many respects, this is why uh, from the beginning I was interested in collaborating with Professor Vasquez Sabat in her Cosmos program, because there's a lot of mathematics in here. I mean, there's a lot of cow shit as well, but there's a lot of mathematics. And so, um, the, um, now, this is sort of like the preview, uh, and then on Thursday is going to be the director's cut. So I'm, on, I'm not going to be able to talk too much about the detail, and all these things are more or less flushed out. Um, but I'll just tell you in general that today, and again, this is work in progress, right? Today, there are four elements to ginger that I've sort of considered. The first one is the idea of a micro farm. Now, Again, this is where mathematics come into play, because it's very easy when you just have a thousand acres of corn, you know, the mathematics there are simple. But when you truly want to do an integrated farm, there's just too many variables to keep track of, because everything happens at a different time, okay? Now, um, I'll hurry up a little bit. So the first element is the concept of a, of a micro farm. The second element is how does that micro farm interact with the network? And the network here means um, an, a network of other fa micro farms following the same idea, a network of um, farms which are not micro farms, and then clients in general. And I'm also introducing uh, several new concepts. One of them I call it open source franchising. And then another one is the F to U networks, farming to urban networks. And the idea here is that, for example, somebody from Fitzroy, which is the neighborhood like Chelsea, where I have a shop in Melbourne, um, if they wanted to buy stuff for, for, for a restaurant or for a house, they, they can go to Kyneton. So there'll be like a website, kyneton to fitzroy.com. Now, business development. Um, I have a whole methodology on how to create in industry. I don't know how many people know this, but you know, 50 or 60 years ago, the Silicon Valley was full of cows in, in orchards. And, you know, it wasn't like the center of the world that it is now when it comes to technology. So the idea of, um, of, of having a, a formal way to develop this is fundamental. And then finally, how the hell are you going to make money out of this? I mean, I can't tell you the number of, I mean, most farmers I know that live in my district, they, they, you know, in, in Australia, if you don't have a thousand acres, they don't even call it a farm over there. For them, it's a hobby farm. Ten thousand acres, and you start talking business. And so, most farmers can't do that. So, monetizing it's um, it's a very important part because otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And then to do that, I have some new ideas. One of them is the idea of delivering the service of nutrition as opposed to selling a product. And within the product, I'm coming up with two new ideas. One of them, I call it a social product, and the other one is a social supply chain. 
And I just want to leave you with I just want to leave you with something to think about. And the first two the first two facts come from uh, Wikipedia, which you know the uh, at the end of the 19th century m most of the Americans um, were involved in agriculture, and of course now it's um, very small. Now the last fact is doesn't come from any kind of source except that a few years ago I did a when I still have a scholarship uh, grant, I did a bunch of traveling around the states and talked to a bunch of academics and farmers, and, and everybody kept repeating this mantra. And it's one of those things that you knew there wasn't any data for it, but it just seemed to become an, a, a universal truth. And they say that over the next generation, the United States is going to have to train five million farmers. And that number, five million, it just kept repeating everywhere. And I mean, the real question here, and it makes sense, because at the end of the day, if you don't have oil, you're going to have less oil if oil gets expensive enough that it's worth using non-oil ways of producing work. You're just going to need to have smaller farms. And so how are, you, how are we as a society going to train five million farmers can, that can be productive? And farming is not something that a 17-year-old kid with a lot of time in his hand in a $2,000 computer can start a company with. Believe me. I mean, you know, there's a joke in farming. You know how to make a small fortune in farming? It's very simple. All you got to do is start with a big one, and then you, pretty soon you have a small one. Anyway, with that, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Ari.